All right, so as mentioned, uh, we are on chapter 7, page 307. For whatever reason, I cannot open the file, the PDF file. It's telling me that it's corrupted. So I went out to the web to try to find the copy that I downloaded previously, and it's not there anymore. All right? Why? I have absolutely no idea. But that, that's fine. I'll just go on. I'm going to do it this way. So rather, <clears throat> I will be referencing things that are in the book, but I'll be doing it via these PowerPoints. This is not the way I wanted to do it, but it's better than doing nothing. All right, so again, chapter uh, 7 starts on page 307. It's called More on Links, Layout, and Mobile. What I will do during the break is I've got the test reviews for you for both chapter 7 and for chapter 8, and I don't think I emailed them to you yet. I don't remember if I did or not. I'll check, and if I did not, I'll email them to you during the break. All right. We've talked about this before, and it will be on your test, next test, in one form or other, but you should all understand the difference between an absolute hyperlink and a relative hyperlink. An absolute hyperlink starts with one of three things, either HTTP colon slash slash or HTTPS colon slash slash or FTP for file transfer protocol colon slash slash. All right, but it is a complete URL. On the other hand, if I am somewhere on a website and I want to go to another page on that website, I might say like dot dot slash to move up a, a folder level or whatever. That's a relative hyperlink, so it's relative to where you currently are. All right. Another thing that we'll look at today, and you will be responsible for this for your next test, is what's called a named fragment. Maybe you've seen this before where you've got a really long document and you get down to the bottom of the document and it's got a hyperlink there that says go to top and you click it, you jump back up to the top. That's what's referred to as a named fragment. That will be on your next written test. I guarantee it. All right, provide for accessibility by configuring ARIA landmark roles for these elements. Again, I can't stress to you too much the importance today of accessibility, all right, to, to make the site available for any and all to see. So we'll talk about that. The next thing that's on there, again, it's on your next written test. What is a CSS sprite? And a sprite is a single file that has a collection of small images in it. You'll see those in the chapter also. Then we'll get into a three column page layout. We've worked with two column before, now we'll jump into three. You can say, well, we just had three column on the test. Yes, that's true, but normally when you've got a three column layout, quite often what you have, just so you can see this, is you'll have, you know, you've got your header up here, you've got your footer down here, that's nothing new, all right? But you might have this might be your content area right here. This might be one aside, and this might be another aside. So in other words, what I'm, what I'm getting to is rather than having just three paragraphs, that's the content area we did before. Now we're going to break it up like this. All right, if you say, I don't know how to do that, there's a big, super long exercise in the chapter where they run through how to do it. All right. Next, configure CSS for printing. Some of the things you may or may not have even thought of with printing. First of all, if I go to print out a website, let's say that I go to Rankin's website and I decide I want to print out you know, their homepage. Okay? You may or may not realize it, but there's, when you go and you print out a website and you, you got it basically set up for color and you're printing to a color printer, that can very quickly go through the ink you know, if you're going to print out several pages. So one of the first things you probably want to do is to set your printing to black and white. Might not sound like a big thing, but it'll typically save you a lot. All right. Second of all, do you really want to do things like print out hyperlinks? How do you want to handle that? We're going to get into all that stuff in here. All right. Next, describe some mobile design best practices. We've talked about mobile design before. We expand the coverage of mobile design in this chapter. 
configure web pages for mobile display using the viewport tag we're going to get into that in fact one on your um i don't know when we're going to do this but probably sometime next week we're going to go through and spend the entire period on a very long exercise i would strongly recommend you be here because it's going to be worth 30 points for you to hand it in and have it working where we're going to run through an entire exercise using a product called bootstrap all right that's going to be an introduction to bootstrap for you all right apply responsive design techniques with media queries you haven't seen this before but one way that you can account for different screen sizes uh, phone versus tablet versus laptop versus desktop are to use what are called CSS media queries you typically put these down near the bottom of your CSS file and what you do it, it's as close to the beginning of programming as we're gonna get for right now what you say is for example all all devices that have a size that's less than 768 pixels do this everything between 769 and 1192 pixels do this all right and there are actual ranges that you use with this stuff we'll go over that when we get to that point all right we'll talk about the new HTML picture element and finally we'll get into talking about Flexbox you will have the opportunity to go through a bunch of Flexbox exercises for your next thing for chapter 7 I'll have to take a look at that I don't remember but I know I have an exercise that I have been preparing for you and I'll try to get it to you if not today I'll email it to you by tomorrow all right okay so the, uh, the author says now we've had some experience coding HTML and CSS so now you're ready for more for lack of better words all right we've talked before about relative versus you know relative hyperlinks versus absolute hyperlinks these are all examples here that you see on the screen of relative hyperlinks how do I know their relatives none of them start with HTTP colon slash slash or HTTPS colon slash slash or FTP colon slash slash those are relative so it's you're on the site already and you want to go to another page relative to where you currently are now hopefully that makes sense to you all right and they give you again plenty of examples here all right and there's a hands-on practice for this on page 309 and three you know the bottom of 308 and 309 all right fragment identifiers this is that thing I mentioned before with like a go to top type of thing and you can do all sorts of things you can jump to anywhere in a document you may have seen this before if you're out on a web page and they might have these hyperlinks all throughout the document that allow you to jump to the bottom jump to the top jump to a current thing that's in there you can jump anywhere that you want to in a document not only that okay you can jump to another document now if you jump to another document and you don't own that document you can only jump to the top of it but if I've got a website and in, on my website I've got two different documents that I've I've created everybody with me so I've got a website I've got two documents on there that I've created I can be in one document and jump to anywhere I want on the other document if I want to do that but most of the time with these fragment identifiers you're jumping to somewhere within the same document most of the time that's the case so they start to mention this on page 310 and again on 311 there's another hands-on practice for it all right so it says here browsers begin the display of a web page at the top of the document that should make sense to you sometimes you want to circumvent that and you want to allow them to go someplace else a specific spot within a web page you do that as mentioned there with a fragment identifier to do this you use two different components you'll have to know both of these for your written test on chapter 7 next week all right first as it says is the element that defines the named fragment we use ID because each one has to be unique on a page all right then we use an anchor tag that tells us to go there it looks a little different because it says ahref equals ID top well there's ID top 
So if I put this at the very beginning of my document, all right, right, right after the body, you know, right after the beginning of the body tag, if I put something like that there, then any place I put this back to the top, no matter how big the document is, and I click it, boom, I jump right back up there. Now, does that make sense? Now, they do mention on the very bottom of page 310, it says older web pages may use the name attribute and refer to named anchors rather than fragment identifiers. It says you shouldn't use this anymore. You should use this way of doing it. But I believe the author is trying to tell you that there are literally millions, if not billions, of lines out there that are legacy code, meaning they were written a long time ago. All right, so you might see this looking a little bit different. On the very bottom of page 311, there is an FAQ there that says, why don't some of my hyperlinks to fragment identifiers work? And it said the web browser fills the, fills the browser with the web page and will scroll to display the name fragment. That may or may not make sense. Look at it this way, okay? Let's say that I've got an article that's on my screen and the article isn't all that big. All right, it's not really that big of an article, and I want to jump to a certain page at part of it. I'm going to go to that part of the document, but that part of the document may not raise up to the top of the page if it's a small article. All right. Landmark roles with ARIA. I don't think you're asked this, but it's mentioned on page 312. ARIA stands for Accessible Rich Internet Applications and they talk about landmarks here. And you've got to kind of look at it this way. What a landmark is, is it's designed to help someone who has some kind of impairment. Most of the time it's someone who's blind, but it can be other things. So what you end up using is something called a role. And what that does is it sends a signal to the browser of the person with the impairment to let them know what this thing is because most of the time it's associated with something that's going to be visual and if you're blind it's not going to help you to be told about something that's visual especially if you've been blind your entire life all right so you typically use this role tag is a role attribute as they mentioned in here and that indicates landmarks on a page some of these landmarks are shown here and there's an example Instead of saying header, you say header, roll equal banner. That is letting the, uh, the browser for the person who is impaired know that that's not just an H1 tag, but it's a major tag that's probably at the top of the website. All right. And again, I can't say this to you too much, just the importance of accessibility and making your website available to everybody, especially if you're a public website or a government website, you've got to do this. It's the law, all right? You know, years ago, you know, I'm taping this stuff, and years ago they came in, they meaning the people at, at the school I used to work at, and said, I'm not sure if you can do your, your uh, if you can create your tapes anymore. And I said, why? They said, do you, do you have the ability to do closed captioning? And I said, I think it's on there, but I don't know how to do it. Well, that, it, it, may come, it may become law pretty soon that you have to do that that any video that you create has to have closed captioning or you can't actually put it out there. The day may come, you know, I don't know if you've ever done this, but I, I used to go out with a woman who loved foreign films. So we would go out and we'd see films of, you know, different, different uh, languages. And we'd always see the writing on the bottom of the page where they'd convert it into English, all right? The day may come when you go out to a movie theater and they have closed captioning on the bottom of everything, all right? I, I, could, I could actually see that happening. All right, jumping on. I don't know if you've ever worked with Target before. What this does, this line says, if I'm on my website, it will go and it will open up Yahoo's site, but it will open it up in a new blank page. Everybody hear that? So remember, Target equals underscore blank will open a link. It'll go to your hyperlink and it'll open that link in a new window. That's considered, you know, it's considered very bad etiquette 
if I would do this and I wouldn't have the target equal blank, then I'm opening up Yahoo in my own site. Does that make sense to you? In my own window. That's considered really bad etiquette because people might, I mean, they're Yahoo, they're not gonna think it's your site. But, but if you link to someone else's site and you don't open it up in a new window, people may think that that site is your site, all right? And that's just considered not the good way to do it. Plus, if you're opening it up in a new window, now they've got two tabs. So they can jump back and forth between your site and that site. So just remember this because it is on your test. So it's target equals underscore blank. There's a few other things that you can do with the target. If you're interested, all right, as you know, or I think you know, I can always come in here and I can type in HTML target tag. And I know one of the first things that's going to come up is W3 schools. There it is. So it tells me. Those are the ways that I can open things up. Underscore blank. All right which opens it up in a new one. Underscore self, which you don't have to use because that does open it up right in where you are. Underscore parent, all right? So if you've got things that you're opening up inside of other things. Underscore top, all right? Which opens the link document in the full body of the window. So there's the one that you have to care about in here is underscore blank, all right? But I just wanted you to see that there are more available than just that one. And as always, now there's a very small hands-on practice on 313, but just so you see that, all right? If you want some practice working with it. The, the author throughout this chapter, it's kind of a miscellaneous chapter because she gives bits and pieces and little descriptions of a lot of different things, such as middle of page 313, block anchor. It says it's typical to use anchor tags to configure phrases or even just a single word as a hyperlink. HTML5 provides a new function for the anchor tag, the block anchor. All right, and the author has got an example in her site, but I'm not gonna go to that. But again, I don't remember if that's on your test or not, but if I type in here HTML5 block anchor tag, I know that one of the first things I'm gonna come up with sooner or later in here is they're gonna show it to me someplace, but here, Block level links in HTML5. I'll look at this one. So there is an example. This is a really nice site if you've never seen it. If you want to become an expert on the newer HTML5 tags, you can go out to html5doctor.com. And in here, they've got a listing of every single tag that there is, and they're all alphabetized. So it's HTML5Doctor, all right, dot com, if you're interested in that. All right. You may or may not have seen this before. You ever have this? I know the other day, um, actually it was a couple weeks ago, my wife asked me to check, and she wanted to see something about, I, I, we were going to, to, to some TJ Maxx store. And I brought it up, I went and searched for it on my phone and found it and it came up and it had the hyperlink that said call. You ever do that? You know, I clicked it and it did call and I had to ask them if they had some dress for my daughter. All right. So the idea is when you use the tell tag, that's what that'll do. Now that's not supported by every browser. Do you remember? And I gave it to you. In fact, a couple of you asked me during the test yesterday. If I want to know if my browser supports the tell tag, what can I do to find out? Anybody remember? Can I use dot com? All right. So I can go out to can I use dot com. I can go out there and I can type in the tell tag, which I think is pretty well supported, but we'll find out. Yep, yes it is. All right. But you should know what that is and how it's used. All right. There's also not just the tell tag, there's SMMS. It says we'll initiate a text message to the phone number. You don't see that as often, especially like from a website. But the other one you're seeing more and more. Yes. You know, 
know on that website how it says Android browser? Uh, you know how there's like dozens and dozens of third party Android browsers? Does that mean it's compatible with all of them too? Or? Uh, not necessarily. There's a lot of Android browsers out there that aren't very good. All right. They will claim yes. All right, but I don't think so. All right, as mentioned, bottom of page 313, going on to 314 with a practice on 314 and 315. You will be asked on your test next week, what is a sprite? Notice it's a single image file that contains multiple small graphics. The idea, it, it's, it's almost as though you took a bunch of thumbnails and you crunched them together into the same file. The advantage of using it is it saves download time. Rather than having to right here, when I've got one, two, three, four different sprites, or four different images, if I can just download it once, it's gonna be faster than having to do four downloads. All right? <clears throat> so it says, a sprite is an image file that contains multiple small graphics. Using this to configure small graphics combined in the sprite as background for various websites is called CSS Sprites. All right, and if you want to see an article on it, it's under a listapart.com slash article slash sprites. They have that on the top of 314. I would suggest that you go through again these practice exercises. You will have to work with a sprite file on your next hands-on test. Guaranteed. So the hands-on practice is on the bottom of 314 and on page 315. And the author even mentions on there, <clears throat> on the middle of page 315, how can I create my own sprite graphics file? And you'll notice there are free generators that will do that for you, and they give you a few of them on the page there. All right. So here's three-column layout. There it is in wireframe. This is from page 315 in the book. This is how it'll look. This doesn't have to be necessarily in this leftmost panel. This doesn't have to be your navigation. Your navigation could still run this way. This could be pictures. It could be anything. Quite often what you see over here is this will be one or more what are referred to as asides. You know what an aside is. That was on your test. It's a tangential article, so it's something related somewhat to what's over here. Okay. So, for instance, this is on Door County, Wisconsin. So if this was on Door County, I might have something over here that said things to do while in Door County, or restaurants in Door County, or hotels in Door County. Does that make sense? All right. So as it says, the common web page layout consists of the header across the top with three columns. But although they say navigation, content, and sidebar, it's just as often going to be done where the navigation is up here, and this will be sidebar, content, and sidebar. All right? It just, it literally, it just depends. So there's a very long hands-on practice that starts on the bottom of 316, and it goes to 317, 318, 319, 320, 321. And 322. Now that's a really long practice, but if you want to do this and you want to understand how to do this, it may be worth your while to do it. Again, on your next hands-on test, to my knowledge, you will have to do a three-column layout. And again, not like we did the three thing, three paragraphs yesterday, an actual full-fledged three-column layout. All right, CSS styling for print. I have already mentioned this to you, but what you can do is if you look right here on the screen, it says media equals screen. True or false, you've never put that on, on, on your CSS. True or false? True, because it's the default. All right, but if you want to have something just for the printer, you say media equal print. Most of the time when people do this, all right, they use media equal screen and media equal print. They have both of them. You can have the same name, but notice wildflowers or wildflower and wildflower print. That's a common practice. 
all right, to set up a, C, a print CSS that's got the same name as the screen CSS, but put print on the end. It's not mandatory that you do that, all right, but that's normally is what people will, will do, all right. So we're talking about creating a second style sheet, and they give you some best practices on the bottom of page 323 and going on to the top of page 324. And let's just take a look at what they mentioned. Hide non-essential content, all right? There might be a photo gallery that if I'm printing that out, I don't want necessarily to print that, okay? Why am I telling you this? This is on your next written test. It says how, basically it says in there, how do you hide content? It's display colon none. All right. When I say hide it, it's still there, but it's invisible. All right. Second, configure font size and color for printing. I already told you about the black and white. You may want to, if you've got, you know, if I've got really big text, I might want to cut it down, make it a smaller size when I print. Control page breaks. You can use CSS for page breaks when you're printing. Did everybody hear that? It's on your next written test. You're asked whether or not you can use CSS, all right, for printing and, and have, for uh, setting up page breaks in printing. And yes, you can. All right. Print URLs for hyperlinks on the middle of page 324. Remember these? We've talked about them a little bit, but there's some more pseudo elements. We've worked with hover and visited, etc., but there are other ones. These right here, the, the ones that are shown here on table 7-2, begin to introduce you to the CSS elements that you use in something that's called jQuery. jQuery is a JavaScript library, and Hopefully you don't find it too scary, but it's going to be uh, less than a month from now. This book's going bye-bye. We're going to be done with it. We're going to go to the other book. And from day one, you're going to start programming in there. All right? At, at first, I'm going to tell you exactly what to put in, and we're going to do it together as a class. But after a while, I turn you loose, and we will get to the point where you will be working on full-fledged JavaScript programs. But when you look at these elements, they all start with a colon, colon after. It says inserts generate, generated content after the selector. What you can do using JavaScript is, for example, I might ask you, the web page comes up, and I might ask you, what is your age? Uh, you know, it just literally might come up on the screen, okay? And boom. Right now, the web page looks pretty bad. You don't really see much of anything in it. But I ask you your age, okay? So I ask person X, and they put down 14. So, okay, you're 14, you're a kid. I don't want to give you much, much text. I want to give you splashy graphics that are colorful. See what I'm saying? All right, the next person comes in. I ask them their age, and they say 55. I don't want splashy graphics. I don't want colorful I want more muted text and, and very simple types of graphics. You can do that, and I can have information appear anywhere I want on the page. If I want it to appear after something that's already there, I use this colon after. If I want it to appear before something that's there, I use the colon before. All right. I showed you the span tag much earlier in the semester. If you remember, we did that right near the beginning where we did that once upon a time and I made the O and once real big. Another way you can do it is by using first letter. Okay? The first line that's there, you may, you know, you may have seen this on websites and not even noticed it. Many times what websites do is at the top of the at the top of their page, their first paragraph, just that first paragraph, it's all in uppercase. Or the first line of text is all in uppercase. If you don't look for it, you don't even notice it's there. But one way if you want to take the first line of text and make it all uppercase is you can use this first line. All right. And they mention right below the, the table on page 324, use the CSS content property 
along with the after and before to generate content. Remember that content property. Think it makes its way onto your test. Another little hands-on practice here, all right? And they show you it's a hands-on practice for, for doing print, and that's on the bottom of 324, 325, 326, and 327. All right, again, there's just not enough time to go over these practice exercises. If you want to, if, if you're interested in them, I'd suggest that you do them yourselves. A couple of you had emailed me and said, you know, that I don't, I, again, I don't know if you didn't, didn't think you did well on the test or what, but you said, you know, I, I think I kind of need more practice. Well, those of you who've asked about a tutor, all the paperwork has been completed. We're waiting to hear back from St. Louis. All right, I've got one of my second year students, Valerie, who has said that she would come in and help tutor people. And hopefully, we're going to find out next week from them. And if you're interested in having a tutor, what we'll do is on days when we have lab, I'm going to ask Valerie to come in and sit in the back there. And anyone who has questions can just bring their machine over by her, and she will work with you. All right. All right, bottom of 326 then. The next thing that's here talks about using the mobile web. All right. So again, the mobile web, uh, I had been asked this by somebody who said, when you talk about mobile web, does that imply both, does that imply both um, phones and tablets? The answer is yes. All right. So when you start talking about styling for the web, and again, this is on the bottom of page 327 and going up to the top of page 328. The first thing to realize before we even look at this stuff that's on your screen here is there's really two or three ways that you can handle, all right, there's two or three ways that you can handle um, mobile design. One way, you know, if, if I look right here, just so you see this, you may or may not care, but, you know, I, I'm from Milwaukee, so I still have, I still get jsonline.com, which is the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. I still get that online. Okay, that's their regular website. If I bring it up on my phone, instead of having it go to www.jsonline.com, it goes to www.m underscore jsonline.com. Anybody want to guess what the M stands for? Mobile. I get the mobile one. So when you try to sit there and you say that I've got a website and I'd like my website to be able to handle mobile, all right, when I do that, well, there's really three ways that you can do it. The first is you can, you can just sit there and you can add hooks into your regular website to handle mobile. That's considered the worst way of doing it because then you've got a website that handles both mobile stuff and non-mobile stuff. And it gets very cluttered very fast. All right. The second way is kind of the way that the Journal Sentinel did it, is to make two different ones. The third way is about the dumbest way that you can think of is to say, we're just not going to do it. And you show your regular website on a mobile device, so it's not responsive. You could try to make it somewhat responsive with media queries, but it's probably not going to do what you want it to do. Now, here's some of the limitations, and they're shown on the bottom of page 328 and going on to 329. Smaller screen size, well, that's pretty obvious. All right, lower bandwidth. I don't know about you, but um, you ever been in a car and you're driving on an interstate or whatever, and you're not the driver, but you know, you've got your phone and you go out to a website, you, you, stuff may work and stuff may totally not work. All right. The former governor of Illinois, when I was living there, Pat Quinn, what he wanted to do was he literally wanted to set up the equivalent of Wi-Fi on, on all of the highways in Illinois. The day will come when that probably will happen virtually just about everywhere. All right. And what's the problems with it? Well, it's not cheap. You know, it's not totally reliable. There's all sorts of things. All right. When you work with mobile devices, limited fonts, limited colors, awkward controls. All right. Because people don't realize they have it, but, but many people are afflicted with 
FTS, which you may not have ever heard of before because I made it up. And FTS stands for Fat Thumb Syndrome. And many people don't realize until they start working with mobile devices that they have fat thumbs. Even if you think I don't think I have fat thumbs, you do when you try to type things. All right, I notice that when I try to type fast on a phone, I can't believe the number of mistakes that I make. All right. Lack of flash support. Years ago, Apple said, we're not going to support flash anymore. Flash is the way, historically, you've shown videos on websites, on just about anything. But years ago, Apple made the, made the uh, decision, we're not supporting flash anymore. And many other browser, you know, not just browser, but platforms and browser manufacturers have come to the same conclusion. It's not that great a product. It won't go away soon, but it's kind of dying a slow death, for lack of better words. Limited processor and memory. All right, if you've ever watched a person trying to do things on their phone, when stuff isn't working and you watch how frustrated they are, that's what they're talking about. And cost per kilobyte. All right, again... I love those commercials that say we have unlimited data plans. No, that's not true. You have unlimited up to a certain point, and after that, if you're 4G, you'll go down to like 2G or whatever. It might be unlimited, but the speed at, uh, at which your system works might be cut in half or more. If you want to read more about some web design best practices, you can go out to the URL that's shown on the top of page 329, I think it is, or the bottom of 328, all right? So how do you optimize? How do you optimize for mobile use? This starts on 329, all right? Limit scrolling to one direction, all right? And typically when you limit scrolling to one direction, it's up and down, right? I mean, I know you can sometimes fling left, fling right, etc. but normally for, for sites, you go up and down. Use heading elements, but be careful not to overuse them. And what I've seen people do is they've got all this text, and then they've got so many heading elements that they're using H4 and H5 elements that other than the fact that they're bolded, they're almost the same size as the text, and it makes it really hard to know that that's a heading element. Use lists to, to still organize information. You know how to do that. Avoid using tables, which are the ne is the next chapter that we'll talk about a little later. Provide labels for form controls. We'll get to that in Chapter 9. Avoid using pixels. I've mentioned this to you before. Don't use this. Don't use this. Don't use pixels and points. Instead, use M's and use percentages. All right, because these are exact units units whereas these are what are referred to as relative units so in other words when you use percentages and m's they attempt to scale depending on the type of media you're using all right but if you use points and pixels they're always that size avoid absolute positioning it's a phone you don't want something always to be on a certain spot in the phone and never move. All right. Hide content that's not essential for mobile use. Many times that means on a mobile site you're going to get rid of a lot of the graphics that are there. Provide minimal navigation. Have it mirror the top of the page and have it always be there. Be consistent with it. Avoid hyperlinks that open files and new windows. I don't know about you. I've got a Galaxy 5, which I guess today now is kind of old. You may or may not have heard the other day, Apple announced their new, what is it, the X? It. Yeah, X iPhone X, $999. You know, and, and it's funny because I was talking to somebody about it in, in one of the other classes yesterday. They were like, who'd ever pay that for a phone? I'm getting a Galaxy 8, $929. All right? So, yeah, you're saving a grand total of 70 bucks. All right? None of this stuff is cheap. And one of the students said yesterday, there's no way I'd ever pay that. And she may or may not realize it, but if she, you know, and she's got an, uh, an iPhone, but if she's got that iPhone and it's part of her bill, all right, she's paying for the iPhone. My kids have got iPhone 5s and they're like 600 bucks. The one that I've got, I'm still paying for, and it's pretty close to that, even though it's older. So this stuff's going to do nothing but get more and more expensive. 
Try to balance the number of hyperlinks on the page and the number of levels needed to access information. I, we, we talked about this earlier, that we said that you should be able to get to any information that you're looking for in three mouse clicks. Everybody remember that? All right. Well, sometimes it'll be even less on a mobile device. You want to take the stuff that their people are most likely to use and make it as simple for them to get to as you possibly can. All right. Avoid displaying images that are wider than the width of the screen. Configure alternate types of thumbnails. All right. Some mobile devices will downsize all images, so avoid using images that contain text because it'll be too hard for them to read. Avoid the use of large graphical images. Specify image sizes in your CSS and provide for alternate text for graphics and other elements. Configure good contrast. This is even more important. All right. Use common typefaces, font typefaces. Configure font size with M's or percentages. We already talked about that. Use short descriptive, descriptive rather, titles. All right. Let's stop it right here. Let's take a break. We're on page 330. I'm going to pick it up. Oh, one last thing, though, just so you know. If you turn on your book on page 330, and you look almost smack dab in the middle of the page, remember this one web thing that we talked about before? It's going to rear its ugly head, and it's on it's on the next written test. As it says, it's the concept of providing a single resource configured for optimal display on multiple types of devices. So you're trying to set something up that will be able to be legible on any type of device. That's what OneWeb is all about. All right, so I've got 857. Let's make it a little longer. Let's come back at 915. And we're going to pick it up in 7-6 on page 330.